reason you get tired and the reason you have injuries is because portions of the body is uh, misaligned with other portions of the body. Hello, everyone. Thank you and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 378. And today our guest is Master Ratinder Ahuja. My name is Jeremy Lesnick. I'm your host. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. And I love martial arts. I love all sorts of martial arts, especially traditional martial arts. And that's what this show is all about. That's actually what Whistlekick is all about. And if you want to check out whistlekick.com, don't forget, use the code PODCAST15, gets you 15% off. And you can find the show notes for this and every other episode, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring this show to you twice a week, all for free. And we've been doing it for nearly four years. Wow. It is amazing to think that we are knocking on episode 400. Blows me away. Now, today's guest was a referral, a recommendation, if you will, from someone way back, episode 82, Mr. Michael Rowe. And he reached out and said, you know, this is a guy you should talk to. And when I have a great conversation with a guest, and then later on they say, this is someone you should talk to, I pretty much green light them and say, yeah, let's do it. Let's get them on the show. And that's what we did. Master Ahuja and I share some things in common besides martial arts, and we talk about those a little bit, but we talk about a lot of things. We talk about his martial arts journey, which, as much as it's similar to all of ours, it's unique, and we dig into some new territory, things that we haven't really talked about before on this show, so I really enjoyed that. So I'm going to step back now and welcome him to the show. Master Ahuja, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. I'm glad to have you here. It's, it's a, you know, I don't know where you are. It's a cold day. I woke up to negative one degree this morning here in Vermont, and it's, it's not a day to be outside, that's for sure. <laughs> so normally I reside in uh, sunny California, in, uh, near, in Saratoga, near San Jose, uh, actually. But this week I happened to be in India. I was... Uh, on a business trip through uh, Asia, I've been through Japan, uh, Indonesia, and now India, and I'll be returning this weekend. Wow, that's that's quite the trip. That that sounds like a well. Hopefully, that's not just a couple of days. Hopefully, that's a a longer trip. Yeah, it's been otherwise it's all on airplanes. True, it's been about a two week trip. Okay, all right, and. Are these trips related to, I mean, you said for work, is work martial arts or is work something else? No, but uh, work is, uh, actually, I'm the CEO of a company called ShieldX Networks, uh, and we specialize in um, cloud security. Uh, I'm, I'm a computer engineer by, by training, so that's what keeps me busy. <laughs> okay. All right. And, you know, I thought I had seen that as we were scheduling things, your your email address, that it rang a bell. I was in IT for a number of years. I have a degree in computer science. So yeah. Yeah. I've heard of you guys. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm sure that where you are in India right now is far warmer than what we have going on here. And I'm sure anywhere in California is warmer than what we have going on here right now. Yes. Yes. But of course we could talk about the weather and bore all of the listeners because we're not here to talk about the weather. We're here to talk about martial arts. And I'm sure we're going to talk about a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff as martial arts relates to your life and, and all the wonderful things that it's brought you. But we've got to go back. We've got to go back all the way to day one. And how did you find martial mm-hmm. arts? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so let's uh, you know go all the way back uh, to when I was probably in uh, like eighth grade or so. So uncle of mine, he had a, a book on karate and it was just lying around and I managed to pick it up and uh, it was just fascinating. And it was one of those uh, practice yourself type books, you know, with pictures in it and, and you go step by step, it was organized by belt. So I grabbed a friend of mine and we said, hey, let's, you know, let's practice karate. And this is in India, right? so this is a long time ago. There weren't uh, as many of the martial arts schools uh, in, throughout India at that time. So anyway, we got a tailor and we said, make us a dress that looks like this. And we got our own uh, first gi. And then uh, we, we got our, and we said, you know, make us a white belt. So he, he 
put together basically i think a piece of cloth and said you know okay how's this and both of us just started uh, practicing and i would go through you know the katas and uh, throws and falls and strikes and we actually started testing each other and we we graduated you know through this book uh, we went on all the way to a brown belt so <laughs> so that was fun <laughs> So <laughs> yeah, you know, there there's some there's a different element in here than when we usually hear this story. We often hear from people who didn't have access or or resources or for whatever reason they didn't have access to what we would think of as a traditional martial arts education. You know, going to a class mm-hmm. and someone who's been doing it for a while shows you what's going on. And so we we hear from people who find a book or you know they checked out a book from the library or something, and they went through it themselves. But here, you went through it with someone else. Yes. (laughs) And I'm I'm curious, you know, because now you've been training a long time. You've got a lot of context for understanding what most of us would consider a quote-unquote proper martial arts education to be. So you're able to, to compare and contrast what what was that what was that like? Were you getting any of it correct? Uh, portions of it, uh, I was, you know, able to master the basic hip throw, for example. Uh, I could get, I could roll, and I, you know, learned a lot of these concepts, uh, the basic falls, and I was so surprised. It was all from that book, and uh, uh, with a, you know, with a with a willing pra- practitioner, we could easily execute uh, some of the throws and the falls, and that was uh, really fun. And fast forward, I went to start an engineering school in India. And, and I, you know, I just kept, I still kept practicing on my own. My buddy was gone. And then I had a chance to uh, find another friend and I said, Hey, let me train you like, you know, a few things. And there's a, one of those shows coming up and, uh, you know, when in college, you kind of do this variety show and said, let's, you know, let's put our name up for a, a, a judo demonstration. I kept it simple. So I would, we would demonstrate some throws and falls. So, so that was my second student. <laughs> so I taught him, and, and we did a show, and it was uh, it was fabulous because again in those days, uh, uh, martial arts in India at least you know, it wasn't as formalized, and there weren't that many schools, so, so people were really surprised to see that uh, in the college. Oh, you know that's really cool, and you know this is one of those points where where I find myself feeling a little bit defensive, right? Because we have folks who may be listening out there and, and, and saying that old refrain, you can't learn martial arts from a book. <laughs> but here's an example of you doing what you could with what you had. And it inspiring enough interest that, you know, and I'm sure we're going to get to this, at some point, you ended up in, again, that more traditional, and I'm using air quotes, yes. martial arts experience. Whereas if those books hadn't existed, if you hadn't had that opportunity, if you hadn't had that training partner, maybe you would have found something else. That is correct. That is correct. I think uh, that that book was, you know, I, I sometimes just call it you know, karmic destiny. I just had to have found that book and started on this path and it uh, kept me going. And then, yes, you're right. Eventually, I finished my bachelor's in electronics in India and I ended up in uh, in Ames, Iowa. So I went to Iowa State University uh, for my master's and my uh, doctorate, in, doctorate in computer engineering. And that's where they had a formal uh, martial arts program. Um, Grandmaster uh, Park ran a program there teaching uh, Taekwondo, Hapkido, and Judo. So now this time, by this time, I had you know some practice with Judo. So and I was like, oh, you know, this falling and throwing is... It's painful at times. And I tried Hapkido. <laughs> and Hapkido had all these locks and uh, locks and joints. And I was saying, oh, man, this is going to rip my wrists out. And I need to go program and code. And so I picked Taekwondo. <laughs> and that started the formal journey. <laughs> you chose Taekwondo because it best dovetailed with your career. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. I, I, I can see the importance in that, you know, absolutely. I mean, there are, there are people who choose Taekwondo for, you know, for, for leg reasons. There are people who choose something other than Taekwondo for leg reasons, right? I mean, we, we can, 
one of the beauties of martial arts as I see it is that because there are so many different ways of approaching this broader overarching idea of martial arts, you know, you can find things that work within, I mean, usually we're, when we're talking about this, we're talking about physical limitations, but you're, you're talking about a, a physical uh, priority. Yeah. <laughs> true, true. So, yeah. so this was 1986. So fall of uh, 1986 is when I ended up uh, in Iowa. And, uh, and I right away found uh, Master Park and I said, you know, hey, sign me up. And it was, it was just wonderful. So I started Taekwondo. Um, but, but, so now, but this time I had, you know, my home training. So I was, uh, I was fairly agile and uh, fairly, uh, and throughout college, I did, you know, weight training and stuff. So I was fairly fit and I did yoga. So I was pretty limber. So this was, so this was, this was fun. I was flexible. I was coordinated. I was uh, uh, fairly athletic and I zipped through all the, to my black belt in one year. So that was fun. Wow. Now, a few questions about that that transition. I mean, and, and it really, I think it is a transition because you had that time training on your own, training self-directed. I think we can, I, I think you may have even called it homeschool. You know, I think it is homeschool martial arts. I mean, that, that's, apparently that's a thing. I, I hadn't even considered it as a thing. But in that year, from from joining to earning your first degree black belt, what did you notice of your experience versus the experience of others? How much did you have to unlearn and how much was, was spot on? How much was what you expected and how much was really different? Yeah. So, um, so I think it, what, what helped me again was the, because I already had the coordination and the flexibility and the basic physics, the biophysics of you know, how the body works and, and you know, how do you position yourself. Uh, so that was all spot on. And uh, of course, the kicking techniques and um, the hand techniques and the, the forms, uh, they were all brand new. And But I started as a white belt, so we had sufficient time and training and rigorous uh, practice. Master Park was classical, <clears throat> you know, fairly traditional uh, Korean grandmaster. And he ran a school, very traditional so I loved it. And, and as you know, many, many hundreds of students come in at the white belt and, you know, probably from one in a thousand probably gets it to the black belt. And I had a similar experience. Lots and lots of students uh, would join and then people would, you know, students come and go and graduate and various reasons. So I was really, uh, really, I really enjoyed the process. Throughout that time, we, we have lots of competitions in neighboring cities. So I, we drove around Iowa a lot and went to you know, a lot of small cities and schools um, all, over, all over the state. So that was fun. Made a lot of friends uh, in the state, including micro. Yeah, and of course, before we started recording, we talked about how this whole conversation is happening because of Mr. Rowe and his, his kindness and in suggesting you. So I just want to give a, give a shout out because a, a lot of the guests that I get the opportunity to talk to, it's because someone who's been on the show had a good experience and, and wants to put somebody else forward. So if any of you out there are listening and you know, whether you've been on the show or you've been listening for a while and you know, someone that would be a great guest, don't, don't hesitate to reach out. There's a form over on the website and, um, Always make sure I mention the first time I mentioned the website, whistlekick martial arts radio.com. Mm -hmm. Don't want to leave anybody. So there you are, you're traveling around Iowa, which, you know, I, I got to say, that's a sentence I don't think I've ever heard before. When I hear people talk about Iowa, it's usually, <laughs> they, they're usually talking about feeling isolated. I mean, was there, was there a culture shock for you or was the foundation that you had in martial arts, the, the family you had in martial arts enough? It, it, it was. I think. I think that, that was. It. So, um, you're right. It was a family uh, feeling, and it was easy for me. I mean, I'm you know here all the way from India. It's my first time ever abroad, and it was uh, just a great feeling. So, loved it. Met a lot of friends. Made a lot of friends. Uh, drove around, you know, Iowa. So it was great. <laughs> cool. Now, at some point. You made it out of Iowa, correct? And you know, you're you're. I kind of want to know about that transition because here here's my guess. My guess is that because 
this school, this master, this family that you developed around martial arts in Iowa? Because that was your first time in, again, and I, and I don't mean, I, I hope this isn't coming through in any kind of critical way, but in this more traditional, this more formalized martial arts environment, I'm going to guess that that meant a lot to you, that that was a pretty big portion of your life. It, it was. Am it was. I right there? Uh, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. So, so, yeah. so you, you left that at some point. So that must have been difficult and for a really good reason. Certainly. So, so it was, it was uh, I think, towards August 89. <clears throat> and uh, there came a time where I was uh, pretty much done with my uh, doctoral uh, coursework. And uh, in this one week, I had to present what is called a prelim, where you present the idea that you'll be working on. And the same week, I had a job interview out in San Jose. And the same week, I had the final black belt uh, test. So <clears throat> all, the th all the three things happened. I passed my prelim. I got the job. I'd flown out to San Jose for that. Uh, came back and finished my black belt test. And by the end of the week, uh, all three things came to a positive conclusion. I got the job, passed the prelim, got the black belt. And then I basically said, well, it's time for me to head west, uh, start my career, and uh, still had to write my dissertation. It was kind of a strange period where everything was done except the dissertation. Most students would stay and write the dissertation. And I decided I could actually finish off that part of the research uh, while I had my a job. So decided to move to California, and that's how I left Iowa. Hmm. That's a pretty big week, weekend, you know, how, however you want to look at that, that period of time. That's a lot of big stuff all at once. Yeah, I still remember it. I, I, I call this out every time I get a chance, you know, um, things happen for a reason. And the Carvick cycle probably concluded that it was time for me to move on. And I got everything that I needed to get there and, <laughs> and started a new, new chapter. Hmm. Now you've mentioned karma a, a couple times. Is is that a? Hmm, I want to choose my words carefully. I don't want to be offensive or anything. I, I don't want to assume. But is this is that part of your spiritual beliefs? Let's get in that way. I I, I think so. Yeah. So I think uh, you know I, I I do believe in uh, in the concept of of uh, your actions and and their subsequent uh, reactions. So it's, uh, you know, do good and and do your, do good for your mind and body, do good for others, serve humanity, uh, help and teach as many people as you can. So all of those, I think, um, you know, do come back and have positive or negative reactions. And so that's, that's why I, I kind of brought that concept up. Sure, sure. And I'm wondering if those core beliefs creep into the way you see martial arts. So, yeah, so, so martial arts, uh, I think for me is to, and slowly over time, I've sort of summarized it in this fashion. It's, uh, it's to create alignment between your mind, body, and soul. So physical exercise, you know, will, if you just do that by isolation, it's going to take care of you physically. And then if you do a lot of meditation, type practices then you know, that'll help you uh, spiritually and if you're in certain fields of work that require you to do a lot of analytical thinking and you know, that's your mental aspects and i think over time um, if you just do one of those eventually you know, that becomes it come, becomes a, a bottleneck in the sense that it'll come it'll reach a point where you can't do any more you know you can't jump any higher and you can only lift so much weight and then you need, and my, at least in my view, you need the other two aspects to be equally strong and, and balance it so you can progress in all those three, three phases, all those three parts. I got it. Makes sense. So here you are, you've left this life in Iowa behind. You're in, you said San Jose? Correct. Okay, so you're in San Jose, California. New job. At some point, not too far into the future, I expect you you finished your dissertation. That was all done. You've you've closed up in a sense your taekwondo training. 
in Iowa, your first school, and what does California hold for you? Yeah, so I ended up in California, and of course, uh, I had a job, but the first thing I did was uh, try to find a, a, a Taekwondo school. So <laughs> I happened to find one close to where, where I worked. And uh, it was, and you may have heard of the name, heard of the, name the Ernie Rice uh, School in the, the, the Ninja Turtle um, yeah. franchise. So Ernie yeah. Rice um, was one of the, yeah, he was one of the masters who, who would be one of the Ninja Turtles. This is a long time ago now. <laughs> So he had he had a you know he has a series of schools there called East West uh, Taekwondo, so uh, and just happened to be conveniently close to to work and uh, signed up there and you know continued continued my training. Wow. Now, had, did you did you know Master Reyes by name at that point, or or was that just uh, luck? No, just coincidence. Just just sheer coincidence okay. that one of his was uh, in that in that in that region. Because that's a name that I grew up in with with very you know thinking in, in very high regard. So that that's I mean, there's a short list of folks who I've I've really been been wanting to bring on this show that that I have not been able to yet, and that I mean absolutely, absolutely yeah. on that list. So what what did your what did your training there look like compared to what you were doing so, yeah. before? So yeah, right. So so taekwondo. You know the good thing about taekwondo is it's fairly standardized. No matter where you go, you do have uh, the same principles and the same set of forms. So in a way, it was pretty straightforward. You know, I came in as a first degree black belt, and and they accepted it, and and I just continued my training. Same same regimen. Again, you know, you go to office and do everything, but five to seven was Taekwondo time, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So, so I continued with that. Even the uh, same days and times. Uh, schedule. And... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was fun. Then uh, great, great uh, set of instructors there, great masters. Uh, again, Taekwondo, you know, students are, because they grow you know, we're growing up in these classes and, and there many of them are there from, you know, white belt on to up to black belt. So a lot of, uh, uh, you know, family type you know, relationships. So I'm, I merged right in and, you know, continued my training and you know, enjoyed it as, as usual. So it was just part and parcel of daily life. And then eventually, now this was in San Jose, eventually I changed jobs. So this is 89 onward. And, you know, over the next few years, I, I changed a few jobs. I went all the way up to San Francisco <clears throat> and and uh, found uh, another Taekwondo school there. So this was run by another by, by another very traditional uh, Korean grandmaster. He was probably one of the first uh, Korean grandmasters to come out to the Bay Area and establish uh, some Taekwondo schools. So and and studied with him for a while. <clears throat> And then I ended up uh, in a city called Mountain View, which is sort of halfway between San Jose and San Francisco. And this is now, by this time, this is 1995 uh, or 94 type time frame. And this is where I met my current grandmaster, Grandmaster Kim. And I started uh, working out with him. And and this is now I had enough you know time and stability that I didn't have to. I wasn't changing jobs as much, and I was in you know one one place. So this is where I had the opportunity to go from second, third, fourth, fifth, you know, all the way to the sixth degree black belt. Wow. Hmm. So that that's quite the journey, you know. And and I think if we if we're honest, it's a bit of an unlikely journey. Yeah. There are a point in time when people tend to lose sight of martial arts. Mm-hmm. Not everyone who relocates halfway across the country, especially for a job, is going to say, you know, one of the first things I did is I went out and found a new martial arts school. But yeah. you did. That was such a priority for you. Why? Yeah. And 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 every time I had to, you know, change jobs and go to a different uh, city, uh, all of the Bay Area here, that was the, you know, you f- get the new job, you find a new apartment, and immediately after that, you go find, I find my new Taekwondo school. <laughs> So, so it was, uh, 
I, I guess it's, it was just discipline that's been ingrained into me. And I would feel just, you know, not complete. You know, it, I, I go to the gym, I, I do workouts, I do running. But for some reason, you know, without that martial arts training, it, it would not be complete. You know, the picture wouldn't be complete. So this is something, you know, is just ingrained into me for, for obviously for the good of it. And uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to do it. And that goes on till, till this date now. Mm. Right on. All right. So there, there's, our, there's our first question, right? <laughs> we, just, we just spent a lot of time digging through, getting, getting some context for who you are and going on a lot of kind of wandering side journeys. And those are always my favorites. But now I'd, I'd like to take a step back and, and ask you, you know, maybe some more specific questions. Let's, let's see where these take us. And my, my first one, my favorite one that I ask people, when you consider your time as a martial artist, certainly you have a lot of stories. But if I was to ask you for your favorite story from your time training, what would that be? Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I'll, I'll recount two stories, if that's okay. And, and they're both part of the training, but very diverse experiences. So along, uh, so right next to my Taekwondo school in, in Mountain View under Master Grandmaster Kim, there was a small uh, Qigong school. And for years, I've just walked by that and walked by that, and I would look at that and say, hmm, you know, there's something here. And then um, <laughs> one day I decided to, uh, and this is about 1999 now, I decided to peek in and, and ask uh, the master there saying, hey, uh, so I want to learn Qigong. You know, what is, what is Qigong? I've heard so much about it. So I wanted to sign up. <laughs> so anyway, I signed up. I, I became, uh, I started to supplement uh, the very hard physical aspects of Taekwondo with um, a more yin style uh, martial arts. And again, I think somehow, uh, again, I would, again, I'm going back to that, that carpet concept because, and, and by this time I was also studying about preparing for these, you know, the black belt tests. You also have to kind of go back into the theory and philosophy of things. And I, you know, dug, found out various books on Taekwondo and martial arts and sort of came to the conclusion that Qigong, uh, at least of the Eastern side, Eastern martial arts became the root of martial arts where from where many systems emerged. And just to divert, diverge a little bit, Qigong um, as it came into China was actually birthed in, uh, in Tibet by a, a South Indian Buddhist monk called Bodhidharma. So he ends up from all the way from, from the end of South India all the way up to the northernmost part of India to in Tibet to teach uh, uh, Buddhism, and he finds out that people are very weak and life is incredibly tough there, and and they need more uh, nourishment and practices. So he takes portion of Indian yoga and trans and transforms it into a system literally translated as the bone marrow transformation exercises, which. Uh, is becomes the root of qigong uh, and then qigong then further develops all the eastern martial arts so anyway <clears throat> so i started uh, supplementing my you know the hard style of taekwondo with the softer styles of, of qigong and in qigong i you learn things like the standing meditations and breathing techniques and you know many of these uh, softer inner inner uh, techniques and one of those is called the dark room training so my, my Qigong master and I found this one school up in Chiang Mai in Thailand where a, a Qigong grandmaster runs a school and he offers this program called the dark room training. You stay in darkness for two weeks. And he's got the specially designed um, rooms and he covers them up with tarp. You can't see your, your hand in front of you. And you have your own room and bath and everything. Just like a five-star cave. So you stay in there for two weeks <laughs> And the idea is sort of again rooted on some of the ancient Eastern practices, which which uh, state that the, the the brain has these three key: um, uh, the pituitary, the pituitary gland, the the hypothalamus, and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, and the these three glands that happen happen to be up in the brain. And they control your entire endocrine system. And over time, the these these ossify, and you know because by the time twenty five, you don't need any more growth hormone in the body, so so they stop working. And the idea behind the start room training is to cut off the visual stimulations so the pituitary gland reawakens and it can 
uh, you know, regenerate some of your body. So that's the theory behind it. But nonetheless, I was just uh, intrigued by the whole thing and decided to do it. And it was a great experience. That was so a little side story, but I thought that was a great uh, you know, experience in my martial arts journey. A five-star cave. I mean, that that's that's a pretty unique description. Yes. <laughs> If it wasn't that, you know, you'd be living in a real cave. Which yeah. Would somehow be closed off. And I don't know how they did it in the ancient, time, ancient times, how they did the dark room practices in the ancient times. But this was fun. <laughs> and then the fun. Other- that, that, that's <laughs> fun is not a word that I think I would have I would have ascribed to that. So it was the whole. Can, can you tell us a little more? Certainly, certainly. So you know, so the whole point of these the qigong and the meditative practices is to is to quieten the mind. And the mind is, is in constant chatter and it prevents you from having clarity of thought and vision. So the breathing techniques, the you know, there's a million meditation techniques and many of them try to, to align your, your, you know, your, 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 uh, your mind to, quite, to quieten the mind so that you have a clear thinking. So you have... Uh, uh, the right reaction, intuitive reactions, and, and things like that. So, so anyway, so the dark room. One of the purposes of dark room training is also to achieve uh, to, to quieten the monkey mind, you know, the, the nonstop chatter that happens in your mind. So, what happens is you get in there in the dark room. There is no more information coming in. There is no more, you know, no no text messages, no no internet, nothing. And then by the third day, your mind is sort of done thinking about anything that needs to be thought of. Right now, you are just totally relaxed. And and during the daytime in this in this uh, school in this in environment they have meditation techniques and so forth, but but you are completely relaxed. There is no nothing disturbing you anymore. You're not worried about the stock market crashing. So you just uh, calm down and calm down. And lots of people have very very bizarre experiences. They they see visions, and all I saw was darkness. I didn't see any of the, any of the visions, but I did enjoy it a lot. And, 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 and by the time we came out, it was, uh, uh, you know, you come out at night and they give you glasses, dark glasses to wear at night because you don't, you haven't seen any light for the last two weeks. And then I come out and, and I have an opportunity to start my, my next company. So, so while the martial arts training is going on, I'm also you know, putting my, my doctorate in computer engineering to use. And I started my first company, got acquired by a company called Cisco Systems. Then I go into the dark room training, come out and start my second company. Uh, and so that's going on in paddle as well while, you know, doing my Taekwondo practice. So this was uh, a unique experience on the, on the, uh, what I, what I call as a practice that supplements my, my Taekwondo training. And then on the Taekwondo side, <clears throat> we had, uh, so Grandmaster Kim, you know, he, he would, ha- he would arrange these really interesting uh, tests. So, uh, as part of the second degree black belt test, I remember he took us to the beach and pretended, oh, is this going to be a fun day? We'll spend some time on the beach. And he goes there and makes us run like 10 kilometers, you know, 10 miles back and forth up and down the beach and <laughs> throws everybody off. And he, and he feeds us a lot of food before that. So the people who didn't have discipline were throwing up and, you know, it was terrible. <laughs> so, so he, and his lesson was, you guys are martial artists. You should always be ready all the time. So, how, you know, how, how can you just eat a big meal knowing that that's going to be it's going to slow you down so you need to think like think like warriors you know think like uh, uh be in that state of mind every time all the time so it would trick us like that and then fast forward to my six degree black belt test <clears throat> and this time uh he says okay we're going to do a, do a thousand roundhouse kicks and we were all shocked. Like, what do you mean, thousand roundhouse kicks? And then he made us do a thousand roundhouse kicks. So, so that was fun. So, and and this point was that your mind and body and spirit will align. You will, you you will be you'll surprise yourself. You know, just let go and uh, just focus on the task at hand. And your and what we found out was that when you're doing and this is you know this by this by this time you're six degree black belts. We are we've gone through this many times. And he says you're reason you get tired and reason you have injuries is because portions of the body is uh, misaligned with other portions of the body. So you're not uh, turning the supporting foot enough and that's why you're talking your knees and, and he says, just let go. Just go with the flow and just keep on going. 
and that was a really important lesson for many of us, even that late into the into our training. Um, you know how to how to just quieten quieten everything and then go with the flow without injuring yourself. Wow, some pretty good stuff there. Now, it, before I asked you to to go a little bit deeper on that, it sounded like you might have been headed into a, a a second story, a second anecdote. Did I cut you off? Uh, no, no. I was just I was just mixing up those two two anecdotes. The 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 soft the softer the softest styles of you know being in darkness for two weeks and not doing anything towards and the second one being this extremely intense uh, training the, the the training of the beach and the thousand sure. tests and, and there was lessons in you know, all of all of that. Absolutely, absolutely. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't I wasn't wrangling you back in when when I didn't actually want to. So. Yeah, there's a there's a lot there. There's a lot of contrast there, and we've certainly had quite a few guests on the show who have started in some kind of quote unquote hard style and and spent some time training in something a little softer, however you you choose to define those terms. And I think that there's something pretty special, and I, and I say this as someone who has only dabbled in qigong, tai chi, etc. There's something pretty special when you can spend time with both. Yes. It absolutely. And, yeah. And, and, you know, you just talked about how, at least my takeaway was, you know, one enhances the other. It is. And if you just do one, my personal feeling is that you, you, you know, you don't, you don't progress. You will, I've seen uh, people that only do Tai Chi or the softer styles, you know, the, or the water styles as we call them. And not the hardest styles, and you can see that you know the the, the physical aspects of a lacking. And then you see uh, people that have done the hard styles for a long time, and and you see the injuries, and you see you know some of the misalignments of their body that has that has crept in over the years because those trainings uh, training is, is incredibly hard. And so I think that that blend is is incredibly important. And I, and it, I think it used to be that way, <laughs> and but over time. Um, schools have become more isolated and uh, you study taekwondo or you study judo or you study you know grappling or you study the meditative arts but i think uh, the intention was that these would all be practiced together we've had a chance to hear from you about some of the wonderful martial artists martial arts instructors that you've had a chance to train with but if there was someone that you could add someone that you haven't had the chance to train with and let's say Anywhere in the world, and even anywhere in time, who would you want to train with? Uh huh. So uh, now that you've added anywhere to the time concept, you know, perhaps I would uh, I, I would like to to go learn from the the, the Bodhidharma, the you know, the, the father of all martial arts, and and understand you know his theories and philosophies. And clearly, he was uh, extremely talented um, in in many many ways. And um, and how he formulated another system to to impart that knowledge to people that had absolutely no training uh, at all, and yet he felt that without that training they would not proceed in their spiritual journeys. Right? He was there to teach Buddhism, but then he paused and actually said, "No, I must teach you this bone marrow transformation techniques, so you can live long enough and be healthy enough." actually make process progress on your spiritual paths because those journeys are even longer and they take many many more years so so that so that he invented a new system based on his knowledge uh, and background i don't know that we've had that answer before it's hard for me to remember some of them are easy right bruce lee is easy to say or, or uh, you know oyama or funakoshi or general Choi. you know these are these are easy answers for me to remember but bodhidharma don't I don't know that we've had that. You might be the first. Yeah, it'll take you back twenty five hundred years, but you know, he yeah, was, he said it could be in any minute time. So, <laughs> I, I did, I did, and and that's why I like asking that question that way because I think it, I think it, maybe even more so than a lot of the other questions that I ask, gets to the heart of who someone is as a martial artist, mm -hmm. and I think if we take that answer that you just gave and your reasoning, 
I think that makes a pretty good summary of everything else that we've heard from you so far today. Would you agree? Yes, I think, uh, yeah. So it sort of brings together the, the analytical mind, the, the reasoning, and trying to understand why, and, and brings it back to a point where it says, you know, this is where it started and, and the reason why it started. And perhaps that's a good time to go back and, and, and observe. Yeah. Now, one of the things we haven't heard you mention, and, and this also, while not completely unique, is rare, is uncommon for a guest who started in Taekwondo. We haven't heard you talk about competition. Ah, certainly, certainly, yes. I, was I, competition something that you engaged in? Oh, yeah. So that, that was the, the point I was trying to make when I was driving, doing journeys around Iowa. So those were oh, okay. Comp- competitive those for competition. Yes, those okay. were competitions, and I, you know, I used to participate, and I have, you know, my, um, I used to get my, you know, silver and gold and forms and swearing. So it was a lot of fun, and me and and Master Micro were uh, pretty much, uh, you know, on those journeys together, and that, that's how we kept in touch. So that was, mm. fun. and then I came out when I came to uh, California. Then I, you know, did some initial uh, at Stanford. They would have a the, the annual competitions would go there. And then I finally went on the refereeing side and the judging side. And then these days when, when I do get an opportunity, you know, I'll, I'll, get, I'll referee or, uh, or judge. Hmm. Nice. Now, have you... Sometimes as people progress, as they spend more time in martial arts, their view on competition can change. And... As someone starts to spend more time in, as you called them, the water arts, their views on competitions can shift a little bit. Has that happened for you? No, because I think uh, uh, competition, which which is you know peculiar to the hard hard styles, right? In the softer styles, that is you you're you're only competing with yourself, or you're competing with the environment. But in the harder styles, you're competing with uh, not only yourself and the environment, but also an opponent. And I think the, it, it's incredibly important. Uh, it, you know, it is truly, uh, you have to do those regularly. Uh, that's how you improve in those, in those skills. Um, and it helps you in life as well, because in life, you will always have competition with the environment. You'll have competition in, in, in at work. You'll have to be competing heavily against other companies. So <clears throat> understanding uh, the, the, the competitive process, but more importantly, I think, again, this sort of goes back to the root of things. Um, the classic art of war, uh, which says you you only you can only exploit an opportunity that the environment provides you, and having that understanding when you're sparring, which is what I what was my philosophy says, I, I'm not going to blindly attack. I'm going to conserve my resources and look for that one opening, that that one opportunity that I can take advantage of, uh, and that would be the most optimal thing to do. So. So I, so I studied you know, the art of war forever, uh, and you can study the more esoteric uh, translations, you can study the, you know, the very poetic translations. And eventually I found a system uh, who, who actually, uh, an author that translated it into more practical terms, and he's got translations or adaptations of the art of war for martial artists, he's got the adaptations of that for people in the industry, for executives, for salespeople. So it was really uh, so <clears throat> great set of learnings. But competition is where you actually get to apply some of those principles. So, so it's incredibly important that, that uh, students do compete. But I think equal, even probably more important is somebody to, uh, for, for students to, to, or the competitors to learn the, the concepts of competition, right? How do you how do you actually compete? How, what results in a successful outcome? That's more important, uh, and I think that many times that is probably not taught, um, and you focused on the just the, the physical aspects of things. So the psychology behind competition, the psychology of the competitors themselves, you know how the environment affects you. Uh, when do you move forward, or when do you just hold positions? So all of them are very well explained in the art of war. It just has to be interpreted appropriately. Makes sense. You know, we're 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 seeing uh, a lot of a lot of cohesion, a lot of 
forgive me, my, my words aren't firing the way I want them today. We're, we're seeing a, a pretty steady path. And what I'm curious now, we don't usually do this, but I'd kind of like to step away from the martial arts stuff because I'm interested in, in you as a business person, because I suspect that there's something in there as well that relates back to what we've been hearing from you as a martial artist. Can you tell us how you got involved with ShieldX? Did you start the company? Yeah, yes, I did. I did. Yes. So this is my this is my fifth startup. So <clears throat> so I finished my doctorate, came out to the Bay Area, and and intuitively, so an art of war teaches you this formally. And the basic concept is that there is a, a shift in a tr- in the trends. So something changes in the environment, and these some of these trends are mega trends, like the you know using the internet, the browser when it first came along, and this fundamentally changes how things are done. So, and as a as a martial artist in the art of war, they would say when these trends occur, when these big trends change, it is your duty to take advantage of those trends, shifts in trend, and and use that opportunity to to improve your position. So it teaches strategy. And there's, you know, there's lots of confusing concepts about strategy, but but Art of War, I think, is one of the best one, best uh, books to, to talk about strategy. And the fundamental thing I learned was that strategy is a it's a systematic, it's a, it's a process to systematically improve your position. So if you go with that mindset and you can apply it now to everything. So in in my Business world in my you know in my technical uh, career, so what I have sort of learned and honed over the years is saying, when the fundamental shift happens in the uh, in the tech world, how does it impact markets and what can I do about it? And then the rest is once you say, okay, hey, the internet usage is going through the roof. You know, this is the opportunity that it presents, and then comes uh, establishing the vision and the mission, mission, the leadership, the organization the processes. And if you look at that, you know, that, that, that is now the regimented part of things. And it looks like a Taekwondo class, you know, where you have a master who's, uh, you know, putting structure around everything and organizing things and making people move in the same direction. So that, so that training intuitively, I think has helped me over the years to, to do a first startup back in 94, which got acquired by Cisco Systems. Uh, then I started my second startup, right out of came out of the dark room. And that got acquired by a company called Extreme Networks. And then I started my third startup uh, in the security business and got acquired by McAfee. Uh, I have another startup that some friends of mine are running. And I started uh, ShieldX in 2015 to address uh, cloud security as cloud usage and became more prevalent. So yeah, so this uh, goes back to those those concepts of, of art of war and strategy and, and structure uh, and mission and creating organizations and, and doing the actions to move that organization forward. So. Now, here's a question that I don't even care if nobody, if, if the folks listening find interest in this, I do, because here's something that we have in common, of course, is martial arts and entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. What similarities do you see between martial arts training and starting a company? Excellent. So one is, uh, you know, like as, as, as I said, if you go towards the roots of martial arts and, and the concept of competition, then some of these concepts that we talked about around, um, you know, how do you, how do you exploit an opportunity when you're competing with somebody? When do you know it's the right time to execute a certain uh, maneuver? And it's dictated by you know, what your opponent has done, what openings have they created? So in the entrepreneurship world, you're trying to <clears throat> you're trying to uh, take advantage and be a first mover because of shift that has happened that has opened up uh, an opportunity. So it's, and you have to be decisive. You have to you know take that action. Uh, you have to have had the years of training behind you to execute that one kick right or to start this new startup. So all of that comes together. Now in the business world, of course, uh, the the it's it's a longer run, um, slightly longer than a you know a two minute round, but all the things that trained you to to excel in that two minute period, the structure, the organization, the, the discipline, so those concepts are are you know I think very similar to what you have to do in the entrepreneurial world as well. So I've had a lot of fun here today. We've talked about a lot of different stuff. We've 
we've gone on some interesting tangents, certainly some things that we haven't heard from guests before. And with, you know, 370 whatever episodes, wow. that's not something that I get to say too often. So I, I want to thank you for that. Oh, I enjoyed it. Thank you. But well, let's, let's kind of shift gears in a sense. Um, if people want to get a hold of you, if they want to learn more about you, maybe they're, they want to learn more about this company or other companies that you've started as you know, a window into who you are as a person, where would they find that information? Oh, I think if you just Google, Google my name, Ratinder Ahuja, um, it'll pop out a number of uh, a website, of course, the company website, my LinkedIn profile, uh, various uh, press interviews that I've done. Um, so a lot of stuff comes up if you Google my first name, last name, Ratinder Ahuja. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. And we'll certainly link from some of that stuff over on the show notes for this episode. Certainly. Great. Okay. Well, I appreciate you being here. And there are two things I kind of want you to leave the audience with before you go today. The first one, well, we'll, we'll just, we'll start with the first one, then I'll ask you the last one. The first one, we've talked about the present, we've talked about the past, we haven't yet talked about the future. So when you look out over the next six, 12 months, heck, look out as far as you want to. Mm-hmm. What do you see ahead of you as a martial artist? So, so as a martial artist, I see uh, the continuous uh, learnings and you know, a, a path of continuous improvement. So uh, uh, you know, I, I, mean, I still practice. We have uh, now my grandmaster, Master Kim, actually retired. Time, you know, time's going by. So a couple of us, a couple of, us, of his students, we started uh, a small school. It was mainly to train ourselves, not, not to be a school. But then a few other kids came along and all of a sudden there's a handful of students that, uh, that work out with us. So we continue to, to practice and we continue to improve. So in fact, my, my uh, other friend of the Six Week Black Belt, who were part of the original school with Master Grandmaster Kim, runs this as a studio now. So he's having a lot of fun and growing. Uh, and actually he taught, we did a little course at Google as well um, in Mountain View in California. So we, you know, so I think I think I continue on the journey. I continue on a, uh, on a path of uh, self-improvement and continuous learning. Um, now there's, you know, mediums like yours, uh, mediums like YouTube, and there's a lot of places to get more ideas and I'm always looking forward to saying what can we bring to uh, to other students in the class so so we continue to experiment and, and improve. Great, great stuff. And then the last thing I'll ask you for today, what parting words would you give to the folks listening? Yeah, so I think uh, what I would tell people is uh, follow a path that you can be a willing sacrifice on. So <clears throat> over time, nobody can force you to do anything. You can't even force yourself to do anything. But if you if you truly enjoy something and, and you are able to sacrifice your time and energy uh, on that path, then, then it becomes a lot of fun. So, so that's, I always do, you know, a lot of people ask me saying, um, what should I do? And, you know, who should I become when I grow up? And I, I always say, pick, pick something that you would be willing to sacrifice for. And, and then it becomes fun. And it's easy because this is what you want to do. One of the hallmarks of this show is the belief that martial arts makes your life better. And we certainly heard a lot of that from our guest today, talking about business, talking about relocating, talking about the difficulties of living in new places, new countries, pursuing education. At every step, it seemed that Master Ahuja was more comfortable because of the foundation he had in martial arts. And I don't think it's a coincidence that that benefit of martial arts came from someone who made sure they had a place to train wherever they went. Thank you, sir, for sharing your story today. I really appreciated our conversation and your time. Don't forget, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for show notes with photos and other episodes and a bunch of other great content. Check it out. Don't forget, whistlekick.com. Use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. We even have a martial arts radio shirt. I don't know that I've ever mentioned that. There's so much stuff over there, I forget what we have. If you value this show, help us out. Make a purchase, share an episode, 
leave us a review somewhere. We appreciate you, and hopefully you appreciate us. If you want to find us on social media, we are at Whistlekick on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's all I've got for you today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Bye.